All right. What's up? We're back here with Brendan from Incendiary. Brendan, how are you, my man? I'm good, dude. Can you hear me all right? I can. You sound wonderful. Thank I you. went with the headphones for maximum clarity. Yep. I appreciate the organization. You're probably the most organized, uh, responsible man in hardcore. So, um, I <laughs> no, do some would say neurotic, uh, but I'll take organized too. I, mean, I didn't say it. I don't know. You, you might have said it. So, uh, if you don't know who Incendiary is, they're uh, the biggest part time band in hardcore. They're um, one of my favorite hardcore bands, probably of all time. Um, Thank you, Will. The, Thank the you. sweet spot of New York hardcore style of, of indecision and snap case groove shit with politically driven hard lyrics. You're just, you're everything I want. You, you give me all the thank things you. I want in a hardcore band. Well, I mean, I, first of all, thank you, especially coming from you. But I think it makes kind of sense, like from where, in terms of the style of music we play, now that you like us, because I feel like we're similar. We're similar ages from a similar area of the country. And that was just like um, what we, what I was into when I was a kid. It was as simple as that. You know what I mean? Yeah, we do like the same shit. And yeah, uh, exactly. So it does make sense. But yeah, I um yeah, I found your band years ago from an uh, my an old uh assistant I worked with recorded uh cost of living actually and right. then we hooked up did well, I was lucky to produce Thousand Miles Stair, the last record with you and yeah, definitely one of one of my favorite records I've ever had a part in. So um, maybe we could do it longer than six days next time, but we'll get into yeah, that later. I would love yeah. to. I mean, it's usually I recording is usually the, my least favorite thing and so horrible and it was not horrible. So it was, it was quite enjo enjoyable, but yeah, I would love to do something again for sure. Yeah. Awesome, man. So, all right. I want to talk to you. There's a lot to talk about. I'm sure you mm -hmm. have a lot of opinions too. So maybe we should just get into it. Um, I'm looking through my Instagram feed and I see people with protest signs with your lyrics yeah. on. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, um, this is awesome. Like this is crossing over. Our world is crossing over into, um, like this world of, with these protests and stuff. And I'm sure you saw it. And like, so how did that make you feel like, how is your, what was your reaction to that? We've gotten to do a lot of cool things. We, the, the band has kind of taken on a life of its own that I never expected that seeing that was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. That's what I would say. Um, I, as it kind of hard to put it in words, I just found it very, um, almost like emotional. It was, I just like, I, and usually I'm, I'm very like cool with everything. I love seeing the idea of like putting a song out to the world and just kind of letting it manifest. But the, the protest stuff with the lyrics in particular I found it again very humbling, and just I, I was I was speechless. I think, in terms of the lyrical content, it's kind of one of those things where, yes, I like that people are resonating with particularly force and neglect, but the fact that it is still relevant is not a good thing for me, and I'm not happy with it. So it's almost one of those things where it's like a. Um, um, you're like a, a negative association. Cause it's like, I can't fucking believe this stuff is still relevant. Cause that song's old. Sure. I, that's I, what uh, I thought too. I mean, what year yeah. was forced to neglect right now? I'm like, this is the fucking protest today. Like Jesus Christ. You yeah. Know? I guess it would be, uh, 2000 and like 13. I, I believe it's seven or eight year, about eight years old now. So 2012, 2013. And it was on our second LP. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, pathetic that it's still so relevant really frankly right it's it's not something that i'm happy about um but in terms of the context of people sort of taking lyrics <clears throat> and words and and then flipping them into empowerment again i just it was it was quite an honor to see that yeah so, um when you wrote that song which would have been like 2012 now going on like you know eight nine years ago that was about um like a different person who was killed by the police. And now yes. here we are again, eight years have passed. A lot's changed in your life. You know, if you were going to write that song again today, what would change? Like, what would you say? The, sorry. I know it's a, I know it's a gnarly it's a question. Good, no, it's a great question. Um, yeah. The, the song was written specifically about uh, the murder of Kelly Thomas, who ironically, I guess was not black, was white in Fullerton, California. Um, and there he was, he was beaten to death. Um, 
what was interesting though is the concept of <clears throat> people in charge and people in the police department Kelly Thomas was meant sort of had a history of mental illness uh, he was homeless at the time and what I what I guess what struck me and why I wrote the song is it was sort of like when you hear the, the the words like you kill the very person you swore to protect the concept of it was of all the people in the world who are being you know who should be under the purview of safety of public safety the most marginalized in a particular society among them is is the homeless and so the concept of doing that not just to a quote unquote regular person but to someone who would actually need help and public services even more so and then to be treated like that that's why i found it so particularly heartbreaking um and sort of that predator type of mentality from the police where it's it's actually preying on the most marginalized in society and that could be from a perspective of race from a perspective of income from a perspective of mental or physical disability just just really making it that much worse right that concept of those in power preying on the weak um, yeah i mean it, it, and it's largely you know it's something that's come up a few times today but it's just police forces being unequipped to handle social services issues in, in any fashion Correct. you know aside yeah. from being under trained for the the actual position that they, that they're supposed to hold to then carry the job of being mediators and social workers and you know and and deal with people who have mental health issues or or you know who have these pre pre existing conditions like they're just not qualified for that and you know yeah I know we you know we haven't talked about it yet but I can't imagine a scenario where you don't support the idea of defunding police to allocate funds to help invest in some of these services so that you don't have to write a song like Force of Neglect. Yeah, that would be ideal. I think the irony of that whole thing is the police and and the concept of defund the police is sort of putting money and reallocating funds into areas that one actually matter and and make more sense in terms of boots on the ground. But I guess the irony of the whole thing to me is somewhere along the way and likely because of funding or whatever the militarization of police went in this left direction and that became kind of a big aspect of it but that whole, the the concept of that would be needed in the most minority of times and the majority of times the concept of being able to take a sort of a, cons a consultative approach if you will towards mental health to social services to what you're talking about whereas 9 times out of 10 if you talk to a police officer they're not having a fucking machine gun and needing that they're having domestic disputes they're dealing particularly in New York City with disturbed individuals and to your point that's precisely what's not being taught yet that's what is happening the overwhelming majority of the time that is actually their day Sure, Joe is, do is doing that stuff, and there's an irony in sort of preparing for some kind of a weird, like war-ish thing. When in reality, that's not actually what's happening in their day-to-day -day process. Sure, I don't know if you saw uh, Justin's interview earlier, but he spoke on this like pretty in depth too, where he said, you know, people call nine one one as a last resort because there's no one else to call. Right, and now you have armed police show up to try to. De escalator solve certain situations that don't require the the use of that kind of force. It requires exactly. mediators. It requires you know a, a, a different rehabilitative service to show up in in a lot of these cases. And now we have these people that have been assigned these nine hats that they have to wear. Right. And I right. and I you know it's frustrating to see. It seems so obvious, and I don't you know other than. Going to going out and voting and pressuring councilmen to reevaluate budgets and stuff. I don't even like. I don't have a solution for it. No one really has a solution mm -hmm. for it, and it's frustrating. But at least, you know, today where we're at right now, you know, it's become a hotbed issue. And this is, you know, for better or worse, it's 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 this, you know, speaking point now in the media, and and you see this defund the policing tagged everywhere. And I think, you know, that's the type of shit that gets the attention of higher ups and people in power and you know maybe maybe that will sort of turn some heads and maybe it will sort of create a, a conversation from a political level and you know 
uh, systemic level of how we can, you know, address this kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it comes, it comes with challenges and, you know, I'm sitting here all day, I'm hearing literally brilliant people, you know, express their opinions and how they feel and stuff. And, you know, everyone's still kind of clueless on how to find a solution. Everyone wishes that if we did this thing, we'd have a solution, but like no one's got a firm course to like a path to, to the end. So I feel yeah. like I should ask you because you are pretty well researched in this kind of stuff. Like where, where do you think we could go? What kind of action do you think, you know, just, just your average, your average white dude sitting in his mm -hmm. studio who wants to do stuff like what's the, what's, what's a good step for action right now? You know? Yeah. I mean, there's action in a, in a, a lot of ways. And I guess I could talk about a lot of things here. Uh, one of the things that I, I do think that <clears throat> I think a lot of people maybe don't agree with me is I, I believe people our age have to fucking vote. Like, I just think that's important, particularly in the election that's coming up in November, but also in the pitiful voter turnouts that you see in local elections, sure. which are just carried and dominated by call it 55 to 65 plus residents of any given area who are really looking to maintain the status quo, which I think is a big thing that you're seeing now just in terms of partisan politics is you have a group of individuals who are trying to sort of innovate and make a change. And then you have people who are very concerned about the maintenance of the status quo. Um, and you can feel the push pull of that in politics, in my opinion. Um, and you can feel that the status quo has this sort of narrative that's placed to sort of, whether it's just the fabric of the American dream or just like, this is the way that things are. And I'm not interested in seeing these things change because this is just how it is. And it is good to the people that are currently in power. So I do think voting is something that's really important. I, I really do, particularly uh, not only the election in November, um, where I, and, and if the voting has to be, I should add something. If the voter is, is, um, the lesser of two evils, I'm fine with picking the lesser of two evils too. If it's going to put us on some kind of a slow course, because these changes take a long time, uh, a slow course towards progress. Because I think in particularly in terms of def defunding the police and things like that, sticking with the narrative theme, there's a culture in the, in the police department, that's clearly apparent with all these sort of bizarre connections to white power movements. Why should that be? Right. What it would be similar if like the the pastry chef community had a large proximity to well, the white power movement. Like it, it shouldn't make sense. Yeah, in any but other it, profession correct. It would be eradicated immediately. You so, know? Right. And so the inherent issue is, is why can me and you talk about that? And it's like, yeah, that does kind of seem like that's a thing. Like that's weird. That's fucking weird that there is sort of this narrative there. So I, I think voting and I think the other thing is um action in terms of things that I, I know uh, Martin just talked about that. And I do agree that social media can be really powerful. I, I also think you have to be careful to only have your world sort of framed through social media um, in terms of what people are posting and sort of, I think there's a lot of great things that can be done with sharing information, with sharing t date and times of rallying and protest. But I do think you have to be careful to judge people based on what they are or are not doing on social media because social media is driving a lot of these problems and we don't have enough time to talk about this, but sure. yeah. I think there are actual things that can be done without having to tweet about it and post about it, right? I think Twitter is something like 30% of the population. So the 70% of America that is not using this tool and are still many people contributing towards goods. Uh, one thing that's been beneficial to me in my life is, is volunteering. And I think there are a lot of ways that people, um, particularly well-off uh, people who've had given the chances that I've had simply being from a white male in a middle-class upbringing. Um, I didn't grow up rich at all, but I grew up in the large scale of America better off than a lot of people, right? Um, you can flip that on its head and volunteer directly in your community by doing a lot of things. And I personally have gained a lot of both. I've learned a tremendous amount, um, but I've also felt a sense of purpose that I was actually helping in my community here in, in New York city where I'm volunteering. Um, but that can be done anywhere. 
that sure. doesn't require any Facebook or Twitter or Instagram posting. And it's something that is direct action into a community. So a there really are a million, million ways to look into that. Yeah. We haven't really talked about volunteering a lot um, on this today. And I think that's actually an excellent point. And, you know, it's more than just sharing a tweet and, you know, re reposting like a picture that affects you. It's actually taking action, getting involved and, in, you know, incendiary is pretty as a band, you've you're pretty involved in a few things right now. Is there anything else going on at the moment? I know you've done a couple charitable events like yeah. so we, far. We we raffled off some things. We we're doing a we've there's a lot of stuff going on, on that front. <clears throat> we are we raised a bunch of money um raffling off test presses, which we have another one today. <clears throat> and we're also put up tour leftovers that we're using to fund additional donations through the sell of our leftover tour merch, awesome. tour merch because Lord knows we don't need that anytime soon. Yep, uh, there. And, um, and then we're also doing some other things that we're kind of coming up with different ideas um, in terms of doing things in Europe. So how can we also raise money outside of the United States for similar type of um, uh, direct action boots on the ground where I'm talking obviously completely less familiar. And so we're using some of our contacts and friends there, hopefully to get something going where we're raising money to donate for, uh, to causes in the EU as well. That's awesome, man. I mean, such a testament to the character of the people in your band and why I love working with you guys and respect your band so much. Um, thank you for coming on here. And thank talk. you for having me. Yep. yep. I think, I think it was a lot to take away from that. I might rewatch this one. This was a good one. Thanks, man. <laughs> I'm going to uh, do uh, while I have you, yeah. A couple of giveaways hanging out there coming up. Look at this fucking thing. So Woo. this is the the split you did, the the test press, the 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 uh scum seven inch test press that no one's ever gotten before, right? This oh, thing's sure. never been given away or so. So this is basically the one of one that exists in the world. Yeah, we um I had to do the nod to Jersey somehow. So I thought this would be a good one to do. Yeah, we don't sell our uh test presses. I have never given them away to anybody. Uh, it's just us and, and Justin at closed casket. And we've also never sold them. And up until this, you know, sort of stuff going on, we've never donated any. So now we've been donating them to raise money. So it's that, and then it's a merch bundle. And then the, um, the coffin logo, a sort of crew neck shirt uh, or t-shirt was sold for 50 pieces at one show once. And so that's left over and exclusive as well. Awesome. So, and then also, which is insane just to add, just to put a stamp on how fucking sick you are, you and Justin came through with this cost of living test press, which yeah. uh, I haven't seen too many of these either. And this this one got, gets this one gets me excited. If I yeah, was, I know this I is a final hardcore kid, I'd be like, ooh, that you know, I did I have a lot of questions about this one. About this one, yeah. So very no, nice, very man. very deep dig for these, and and I appreciate that. I always appreciate talking with you, man, and. Thank you for being a part of this. Keep me in the loop on what you're doing in Europe. I'm actually pretty curious. I will. Yeah, that's something that we've been talking to some of our, our merch store over there about, and I want to do something cool. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me amongst all these great people. And you, dude, you look great. You've been doing this like six hours. You look fresh as a daisy. We're on hour seven right now. Yeah. Catch me, catch me tomorrow night. We'll see how I'm feeling. Like, uh, yeah. Throw code T. All, all good, man. All right, Brennan. I appreciate it, brother. Thank Take you for being you. on. Talk to Later. you soon. Bye. Brennan Garone, tremendous human being. $10 donation, a charitable donation at soundring.live. And you can win not one, but two different extremely rare incendiary test presses and some rare merch. Jesus Christ, go donate. I'm tired of saying it. All right, I'm going to take two minutes and I'm going to be back with my good friend, Tom Williams. So hang in there.